Hi everyone and welcome to another edition of Sports Time Out. I'm Anthony Palladano. We've got plenty of stuff to cover in today's show. We'll start out with boys soccer as area teams entered the home stretch of the regular season. There's Ford goalie Jeremy Clark. First time he played Eisenhower this year, 23 saves in the loss. Clark would have to come up big in this one as once again Eisenhower was testing the Falcon goalie. Wade Allen with the shot early. Clark climbs the ladder in traffic, makes the save. 28 saves for Clark this time up. But would it be enough? Pick up the action, the scoring action in the first 20 minutes in. Look at Matt Mosheri doing some great work. Just threading the Ford defense out to Justin Moran. Moran beats Clark and Eisenhower grabs the one nothing lead at the 22-14 mark. Dave Crawford's team just not enough support for Clark in this one. Wade Allen on the free start beats Clark. Eisenhower takes it, three zip. Ford hustled and worked, and but you know we have a lot of seniors. We're a good team, so um, as long as we're tight in the back, don't give away goals. I think we'll get a, a goal or two against most teams. So out to Utica we go. Parents' night is the Chieftains played host to undefeated Romeo. Pick up the action in the first. Tim Rivington. On the restart, serves up a nice ball. Utica gets ahead on it, but Mike Craig comes up with the save. Tied at zero at the half. 19.33 left in the game. Utica controlling play until Dwayne Hopkins goes out with a yellow card. That gives the Bulldogs just enough light. The door's cracked open. Adam Sarkissian walks through. He beats Mike Corliss for the goal. Romeo takes the lead with 13.29 left. Hopkins back in. Great opportunity here, but Craig comes up with one of his 14 saves as the Bulldogs hold on to win it. 1-0. Over to Ford we go. Justin Hatfield out for the season with the broken leg. As the Falcons lose their top goal scorer going into their game. With Anchor Bay second year in a row, Dave Crawford has lost his leading goal scorer on the season. Pick up the action in the first. Cal Von and Bank with the throw in. Hits the crossbar, but then hits the goal post. So the goal by Mike Siegel disallowed. Good call by the referees. We are still tied at zero. Once again, Clark being tested in this one. And Clark coming up big for most of the game anyway. They're still scoreless. But Anchor Bay finally gets on the board. Just three minutes left to go on the contest. Ryan Robinette finally beats Clark. And the Tars with the late goal pull out the one to nothing victory. Back up to Swinehart we go for Eisenhower against Stevenson. Don't respect them, guys. Go out there and challenge them, all right? Don't lay off of them. Mondu trying to talk his players into going after Ike and not showing respect for all the Ike talent, but it's tough to disrespect Ike. They will not be disrespected. Eisenhower with a near goal here, but Stevenson able to uh, kick it out of the zone. But Wade Allen... Almost a replay here. Ball's kind of kicking around. Peter Nowak knows what to do with it. He gets the goal. The Stallion transfer puts Ike on the board. 1-0 with 21-41 left to go in the first. Eisenhower up now 2-0 after a goal by Wade Allen. This is a pretty goal here. Nice serve ahead to Sean Stojanovsky. Stojanovsky finishes it. Eisenhower finishes Stevenson by the final score of 4 to zip. Congratulations to Ike on running the table in the Mac Red Division. Time now to turn our attention indoors to girls basketball. Start out at Stevenson, Casey Roberts and the Titans playing host to Lance Cruz. And the Titans were cruising early in this one. Leanna Bohr, her best game of the season up to this point. Turnaround jumper there, 8-1 Stevenson up out of the gate. More Titan passing here. Five assists for Molly Dwyer in the first quarter. Most of them to Leanna Bohr. Boar's bucket made it 14-3 Titans. Now, Dwyer doesn't only pass, she scores too. The triple there for Dwyer makes it 19-7. Stevenson builds a 19-point first half lead. But the Lancers come back. Stephanie Monroe with the steal, then gets it back. Bucket and the foul 
the Lancers would close to within 10 early in the third quarter, but just too much Stevenson in this one and too much Leanna Bohr. LB with the putback. She had a double-double, 20 and 10. Stevenson wins this one going away. Dwyer comes up with the steal. She had a double-double as well. So the Titans take it 66 to 43. Stevenson would then go up to Eisenhower. Ike kind of resembling a school of fish here in this little warm-up, kind of a volleyball-esque drill. As the Eagles got off to the good start, maybe the warm-up worked. Monica McCarroll with the long two, nine to four. Eisenhower out of the gates pretty well, but Stevenson comes back. Dwyer with the rebound. She gets it ahead to freshman Talitha Robertson, and Robertson gets the bucket and the foul. Stevenson trailed by one at the end of one. On to the second quarter we go. More of these Stevenson underclassmen getting into the act. Some new faces coming up big in this one. Emily Black there, the recipient of that good passing. Stevenson up by seven. Kevin Donahue urging his team to come back, and they do in the third quarter as they open up the third quarter strong. Mandy Phillips with the injured hand and all. They'll turn around there to pull Ike within three, and then Nicole Waiter off of the missed Christy Singletary shot puts it back up. Eisenhower takes the lead 22 to 21. But Casey Roberts Titans come back and put together a solid fourth quarter on the road. Off of the Lauren Myrana miss, it's Bohr to Dwyer. Dwyer gets it ahead to Black. Black, her best game of the young season. Stevenson beats Ike 41 33. So we move on from Eisenhower back to Sterling Heights as the Stallions are playing host to a tough Romeo team coming in just four and seven, but they're a little underrated. Pick up the action in the first. Melissa Tarasov to the three-pointer. Stallions up eight to two. Tarasov had eight points in the first quarter. Second quarter we go, the pass goes to no one in particular. Tarasov picks it up, finds Nicole Silk on the break and the Stallions and Tom Daly's team were up 16 to 12. More Stallions on the break, Tarasov so quick, gets it up to Caitlin O'Gara. Gara off the bench for two. Stallions up 20 to 16 at the half. Connie Herndon's team though, comes back in the second half. They got a great game from their star center, Brooke Heike in this one as the Stallions were having a tough time dealing with her. Chelsea Leach is gonna dribble it up the floor and get the ball to Heike. Heike, little jumper, great range for the center. Three-point lead for Romeo. Romeo puts this one away. Check out this great move by Heike. She had 20 points on the night. Bulldogs by 13. The fall of 2004 has brought with it not only the changing of the leaves, but also the changing of ADs at a pair of local high schools. Susie Grendon has taken over for Rick Radalski at Stevenson, while Chris Korteg replaced Bruce Hart at Eisenhower. We caught up to both Grendon a few weeks ago and Korteg before the fall season to get their thoughts on making the transition to athletic director. Okay, well, I've done coaching in the district. Um, I've coached cheerleaders and volleyball. Um, I did dance team. I've done tennis. So I've had the coaching background. Um, I left coaching when I transferred from Ford to Stevenson. Um, and I, you know, I like the coaching aspect of it, but uh, you know, I felt I really wanted to get into the administration end of it. You know, I was the consummate gym rat. I, uh, in junior high, I ran track played basketball, played football, high school, I wrestled, ran track, cross country, played a year of football. Uh, obviously, I love soccer, so, you know, yeah, I, I do like sports. And I think that uh, you have to love sports if you're going to take this job. My goals for the job is, is of course, to make, make sure that things run smoothly. Um, but I want to really try and balance um, everything out so that there isn't one sport that's um, especially dominant over the others. Um, I feel that all the sports deserve their credit and their attention, and so it's really been my goal to make sure that all of the sports feel that they are attended to and that they are important. Well, my goal for the first year is to just learn the job, learn the people, learn the coaches, uh, get the job down, um, the demands of that, the, the responsibilities, and then maybe the second year, start setting some uh, mid and long-term goals and, and expand. But right now, this first year, I just, it's nuts and bolts. Learn the, learn the job. Korteg's new position means a couple of vacancies at his old post, as Korteg will step down as the boys' soccer coach after this season. He will also not be coaching Ike's girls' soccer team in the spring. 
That's not all the news from the coaching ranks. Here are some other local coaches on the move. On the move, former Henry Ford II boys basketball coach Jim Barker as he has agreed to coach Centerline St. Clement. Barker previously was quoted as saying he would never again coach in Macomb County. Apparently the coach has had a change of heart. Barker in his 512 career wins was recently elected into the Michigan High School Basketball Coaches Association's Hall of Fame with his former assistant, Mike McInerney. Also on the move, Rick Corbeil has resigned after two years at the helm at Sterling Heights High School. Corbeil's two seasons, uh, not so good. 13 wins, 29 losses for Corbeil. Former JV coach Mike Griffin will take over as Corbeil's replacement. Also leaving Sterling Heights, Paul Freitag, one and done for the baseball coach, 12 and 16 in one season as the Stallion skipper. His replacement has not yet been named. Also resigning, Al Havers up at Utica. Two years as the Utica girls volleyball coach. 25 wins, 38 losses, and 10 ties in his two seasons with the Chieftains. That got us to thinking, who's the longest tenured coach we have? Well, the answer, Eisenhower's Bob Lancey. Three of the five longest tenured coaches we have are in track and cross country. Ernie Shulo leads the ADs in tenure with eight years. David Borkowski graduated from Sterling Heights before Shulo took over, and this past summer, the former Stallion and former Detroit Tiger resurfaced in the major leagues with the Baltimore Orioles. Borkowski leads off this edition of the Alumni Update. David Borkowski, 56 innings pitched, 3 wins, 4 losses, 5.14 earned run average for the Baltimore Orioles this year. Some other Local players to look at, Stacy Rogers doing well up at Western Michigan out of Eisenhower. She's joined by Val McIntyre out of Ford and Katie Rosinski. John Curtis has walked on and made the Bronco football team at Western. Mike Roswalski kicking for Central Michigan University. Kerry St. Alban doing well for the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Mike Tennessee and John DiGiorgio having good years at Grand Valley and Saginaw Valley. Katie Terry at Saginaw Valley State, Jessica Beaker, Kristen Junga, and Krista St. Alban there as well. Kendall Enmark hurt at Pitt. Well, it's time to get back to the highlights, and we'll check out football. Start out Eisenhower playing host to Henry Ford, and Eisenhower all eyes on Derek Chris. Actually, all the Ford eyes should have been on Derek Chris, and they were. But no one's hands were on him. Look at Derek Chris on this punt return. Already with a 69-yard touchdown reception in the game. Here he clocks in with a 64-yard punt return for a TD. And Eisenhower was up 17 to nothing. Chris done yet? No, I don't think so. The Eisenhower special teams special in this one. 78 yards on this punt return for Chris. Ford not even near him out there. 41 to 7, Ike beats the Falcons. Chris, a huge day for the Eagles. Moving on to Dakota. They've got a very fine stadium up there in Macomb Township. Chieftains in town to take on the Cougars. Pick up the action in the first half. Tim Hiller back to pass. He completes it to the wrong team. Jason Van Flutteren takes it in from 45 yards out. And Utica was thinking upset as they led 17 to nothing. Jim Vigas getting greedy and wanting some more. Hey, why not? Utica with a new look team this year and they're playing very well. Their offense gets on the board and contributes in the second. Jordan Roberts to David Van De Winkle and the Chieftains had the Cougars hoodwinked. It was 14 to three, Utica late in the second. Utica not done yet though. Roberts back to pass. Finds Steve Folks over the middle. 25 yards on that hookup. It would set up this Rich McCarthy chip shot field goal. And at the half, it was all Utica's. They led 17 to three. Second half though, a different story. Utica's offense starts turning the ball over. Here Kyle Bazzi comes up with the interception for the Cougars and the offense gets into gear. They get in the gear behind Greg Gay. Look at the sophomore making some great moves right there. 46 yards later, the nephew of Source Sports writer Kevin Lozon is in the end zone, and it was 17 to 10. Jim Vigas saying, I didn't know anyone related to Lozon could run that fast. Seems hard to believe, but look, it's true. Gay again powers this one in from nine yards out. We were tied at 17. 
after a Utica turnover. Dakota then turns that turnover into points on this game-winning drive. The drive capped off by Hiller's replacement, Andy Brueggemann. Fools almost everyone into the corner from three yards out. Dakota takes it 24 to 17 as they stave off, save off the upset. On to Sterling Heights. The Huskies of Port Huron Northern taking on Sterling Heights. Jordan McKelvey. Yeah, guess who's got the ball? 48 yards later, he's in the Stallion territory in the first quarter on the opening drive for Port Huron Northern. Cutlip's team having a hard time defensively early in this one. Stop in the run. Look at that. It's Ryan Schmidt breaking tackles and scoring from 14 yards out in the Huskies. Missed the extra point. We're up 6-0. They're up 13-7 in the second. They tack on more to that. This time it's Kevin Neust from 10 yards out. His second touchdown of the first half. The Huskies 18-7 lead at the half with... 240 yards rushing against the Stallion defense. Stallions turn it around in the second half. Hey, Mo! They go to Mo Asker from seven yards out, or three yards out, to make it 18 to 14. Sterling Heights back within four. More Mo in the third. This time, Asker does it again from 16 yards out. Second touchdown of the night. Stallions take the lead, a lead they would never give back after a Torian Lake touchdown. Made it 18 to 30, Stallions up by 12. Dave Malinowski comes through on the punt block. He blocks it, James Rule picks it up and rumbles in. Stallions up 37-18 after a Billy Moncrief field goal. All that was left was Enwia Yokana. Wea with the score, listed as 140 pound defensive lineman. Stallions take it with a 40 point second half, 47-18. Back to Stevenson we go. The Big Reds in town to take on the Titans. First quarter action, LJ revved up and rumbling in from three yards out. Stevenson with a 7-0 lead early. They tack on more to it. Titans get scores out of their first three drives thanks to great catches like that one from Frank Zombo. Later in their second drive as we're now in the second quarter as the Titans ball control was working pretty well. Here LJ Robertson behind four perfect blocks takes this one into the end zone untouched. 14 to nothing, Stevenson up. Now 14 to three, Stevenson up. Rick by goes to the air. Danny Stiefel back to pass. He's gonna find Ricky Venetilia just over the outstretched arms of the Chippewa Valley defender and then beep, beep, the road runner is gone. 21 to 13, Titans touchdowns on the first three drives. They were in command, but Rick By knew that Chippewa Valley is a tough team and they were gonna come back and they do. Behind the rushing of Rob Carollo. 33 carries for Carollo on the game. This one is the longest one and a touchdown. 29 yards on the score, the Big Reds back in the game as they trail 21-17. In the fourth, Big Red's chance to score. Joe Simon's pass, look at this. Dangerous, tipped, 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 and finally incomplete. Big Red's miss a field goal on that drive. They still trailed by four. Last chance for the Big Reds. Simon loads up, but Andrew Stafford, the shortstop back there playing center field, makes the pick, and the Titans hold on and preserve the win, 21-17. We go from football to cross country. And out to Delia Park we go. We start out with the girls and the Division I teams, which locally featured Sterling Heights, Stevenson, and Eisenhower. Kelly Lemke was in third place early on, and she held that position the entire race for Stevenson, finishing third. Eisenhower's top finisher was Sherry Rogers, who finished eighth with the time of 20-27. In addition to Lemke's great performance for the Titans, Stevenson also got great performances from Adrian Dent, Erica Langhauser, and Nicole Jandrin, who finished 10th, 11th, and 12th respectively for the Titans. That meant their number five runner, Caitlin Litz's 17th finish, would help Stevenson lock up first place overall. Congratulations, Titans, as they finished with 53 points, 17 points better than second place, Troy Athens. My time was wasn't exactly what I wanted it to be, but the course was kind of slow today because of the rain, so I'm pretty happy with it. Uh, girls ran very, very well, um, but in defense, um, the one thing is Clarkston did not run their best team. Clarkston's one of the top teams in the country here, and they did not run their top girls, so um, it's, a, it's a little deceiving, but, but we're very happy still to win. 
And in Division 2, Ford was the lone local competitor. The Titans did run their B team in the race. The Falcons could muster only an 8th place finish. Melissa Anderson's 23rd place finish was tops amongst the Falcon runners. Runner set! On to the boys' side of things we go. Now remember when your mom embarrassed you at the race the one time? Hey, Brad! Brad, you're doing great! Go, Brad! Brad, 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 Yeah, I don't, can't explain the fish, and I'm not going to try to explain the fish. Hopefully, it's a superstitious luck thing. Stallions, Eagles, and Titans all ran in Division I. The Stallions had the top total for the boys' teams, finishing seventh. Jimmy Partridge, who has battled back from a preseason stress fracture in his foot, led the way. He was the highest among the local finishers, earning a 10th place finish for the time of 17-14. Teammate Mike Craze was 15th for the Stallions, 18 seconds behind his teammate. Ike finished the race eighth overall. Stevenson was ninth. I felt pretty good. I don't know. I, I think I could have went a lot harder, but I waited too long, and by the time I picked it up, they were too far ahead. But it was all right. I'm getting back into it. I had a stress fracture early in the season, but uh, I'm still like, gradually getting back into it. So we performed decently. Uh, we, I think, everybody ran a faster time than we ran the Jubilee here uh, about two weeks ago, three weeks ago. So we're we're improving. Uh, we didn't. Uh, we're capable of running better than we than we did today, though. In Division Two, Ford ran well, placing second overall with four runners in the top 25. Pat Webster led the Falcons, finishing eighth. Well, we uh, got out a little bit slower than I anticipated, but they uh, came back last mile and raced pretty well and uh, picked off as many runners as they could uh, on the way, you know, on the last mile coming down home. So. You know, that's a good sign. Uh, I feel pretty good, actually. I didn't get the time I wanted, but I went out strong and did what I had to do for the team. I was working in the lab late one night when my eyes beheld and well, as we all know, tis the season of ghosts and pumpkins, and we here at Sports Time Out have decided to have a little fun with source sports writer Kevin Lozon. Kevin chimes in now and gives us our tricks and treats of the season. Tricks, the teams that have scared us a little bit, and the treats being the teams of sweet surprise. Okay, here we go. The number three trick of the year this year is obviously the Ford soccer team. This team has been uh, hurt by injuries so much this year. They lost their top defender in Chris Falzone. They lost their top offense player in Justin Hatfield. And then right week before the district start, they lose their top goalie and sophomore Jeremy Clark with a broken hand. Um, call it bad luck, call we will, but still this team should have been a little bit better when they had the kids healthy in the MAC Red. Uh, our number two, or my number two uh, trick of the year is obviously the Eisenhower girls basketball team. Uh, this team had a majority of their players back this season led by Mandy Phillips, Laura Marana, and Chrissy Singletary. And they just have not come up to its expectations. They have struggled all season long. And offensively, they, they just haven't been able to put anything together this year. And, and they've been a very big disappointment so far. Uh, and the number one trick of the year, um, the Sterling Heights football team. Um, this team, uh, I don't know what it is. They have so much talent. They just have not been able to execute offensively. I don't know if it was the pressure of going to the to the uh, regional final last year and all the expectations that were put on this year. but. Coach Dave Culliff and his staff have, have suffered uh, many disappointments throughout this season, and uh, and those are our tricks of the year. On the flip side, now for the good news, uh, the treats of the year starting at number three, and there have been more treats than there have been tricks. So number three is the Utica girls basketball team. Um, last year they struggled to find their find their rhythm offensively, and uh, maybe there was just youth. We don't know, but this year they have really put together at the midway point, they're in, a, they're in the thick of the MAC Red uh, basketball um, race. Uh, led by Manny Pajowski, Kim Donnelly, and Amanda Hunt. They've been they've been very solid with great help off the bench and as a starter uh, from uh, from Annette Hallsworth. Uh, our number two team is the Ford Girls basketball team. Uh, this team here, new coach Matt Joseph. He took over a team last year that I think they only won three or four games. Uh, he's done a whale of a job. Um, they've